Christ destroyed our death. In rising, Christ restored our life. Christ will come again in glory. As in baptism, Roy put on Christ, so in Christ may Roy be clothed in glory. Here and now, dear friends, we are God's children. What we shall be has not yet been revealed, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, and we shall see him as he is. Those who have this hope purify themselves as Christ is pure. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, yet shall they live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I hold the keys of hell and death. Because I live, you shall live also. Friends, we have gathered here to praise God and to witness to our faith as we celebrate the life of Roy Crooks. We come together in grief, acknowledging our human loss. May God grant us grace that in pain we may find comfort, in sorrow, hope, and in death, resurrection. On behalf of the family, I welcome you and hope that you will stay afterwards for the repast, a time of fellowship, maybe some stories, but you're invited to tell stories during this time of service as well. So we come into God's house to worship Him, to give thanks, and to acknowledge that we need to speak to Him from time to time. And when that is, we take it to the Lord in prayer. I invite you to pick up your hymn book and look up hymn number 526, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Then stand and sing.
O God who gave us birth, you are ever more ready to hear than we are to pray and to know our needs before we ask and our ignorance in asking. Give to us now your grace that as we shrink before the mystery of death, we may see the light of eternity. Speak to us once more your solemn message of life and of death, and help us to live as those who are prepared to die, and when our days here are accomplished, enable us to die as those who go forth to live, so that, living or dying, our life may be in you, and that nothing in life or in death will be able to separate us from your great love in Christ Jesus. O oh, eternal God, we praise you for the great company of all those who have finished their course in faith and now rest from their labor. We praise you for those dear to us whom we name in our hearts before you. And especially we praise you for Roy Crooks, whom you have graciously received into your presence. To all of these, grant your peace, that perpetual light shine upon them, and help us so to believe where we have not seen that your presence may lead us through our years and bring us at last with them into the joy of your home, not made with hands, but eternal in the heavens. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us when together to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. It's good to turn to prayer. It's good to turn to Scripture. Then, Federico is coming to read to us now from Psalm 23. Listen for the word of God. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the right path for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies, you anoint my head with oil, my cup flow overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. Thank you. <coughs> Jackie McCork will come forward now to read from selections of John's Gospel, chapter 14. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, and I will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, and the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me, because I live. You also will live. I have said these things to you while I am still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, 
will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. This is the word of the Lord. Michelle Rankin will come now to read from Psalm 103. Thanksgiving for God's goodness. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and do not forget all his benefits. Who forgives all your inequity? Who heals all your diseases? Who redeems your life from the pit? Who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy? Who satisfies you with good as long as you live so that your youth is renewed like the eagles? The Lord works vindication and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always accuse, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, he, so far he removes our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion for his children, so the Lord has compassion for those who fear him. For he knows how we were made, he remembers that we are dust. As mortals, their days are like grass. They flourish like a flower of the field, for the wind passes over it and it is gone, and its place knows it no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him, and his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, O oh, you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, obedient to his spoken word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers that do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O oh, my soul. Let the church say amen. 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 Thank you. Steadfast love of the Lord. Well, Joan Tapper is going to come and sing for us now, How Great Thou Art, a solo. And, and we love this song because it just reminds us that God is present in a very special way, even in moments of sadness and loss. How great thou art. After this, the ushers will come forward uh, for a prayer for the offering. Thank you. 
Yes, let's come forward now. Lord, I love this church. I see you in ministry for many years and wishes that an offering be taken, the family wish the offering would be taken for the ongoing mission and ministry of the Miramar United Methodist Church. Let us pray. Oh, gracious God, we thank you for the many gifts Roy brought to the world and brought to this church and that his family bring to this church. And so, Lord, we pray that as we give of our gifts that they will be used and multiplied and shared not just around this church but around the world, that more and more people will know that you love them and that you have a plan for their life and that you have the offer of abundant life on this earth and eternal life when we go from this earth. So, gracious God, we dedicate ourselves to that ongoing task, the task that Roy cannot directly engage in anymore, but that we can, while we're on this earth, continue to love as Jesus loved. And so may these gifts be part of our love as Jesus loved, and we dedicate them to Jesus. Amen. to a time of sharing. Michelle will come and read the obituary. Doreen will come with some eulogy and uh, if you'd like to come after them I invite you to do so. Come forward please. Silvorn so Crooks 97 of Plantation, Florida, passed away on October 7, 2023, in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. So Roy W. Crooks, passionately known as Roy, or Uncle Roy, which many of us know him as, um, was born in Mandeville, Jamaica, to Cyril and Edith Crooks, Nihiran, on January 5, 1926. He attended Manchester Secondary School in Mandeville, Jamaica. After graduating from secondary school, he went to study law at Delapen and Ivor Law Firm. Within a year, he joined the Royal Air Force in England. After his time in the Royal Air Force, he returned to Jamaica, where he married Doreen Dunn. He was an entrepreneur who owned several businesses in Jamaica until he moved to the United States. While in the United States, he spent 10 years working for the Board of Education in New York. He eventually moved to Florida, where he was an Associate Director of Security at a hospital in South Florida until he retired. Roy is preceded in death by his parents, his sister, his first son Patrick, and a grandson. 
Roy is survived by his spouse, Doreen Crooks, four of his five children, Jackie, Rohan, Dwayne, and Michelle, six grandchildren and two great-grandchildren. The family of Roy Crooks wishes to extend our sincere thanks to Chen's Medical, Chen Senior Medical, Vita's Hospice, Senior Nanny, Pastor David Range, and Miramar United Methodist Church, and the many individual family and friends who have cared for and supported Roy during the last years of his life. I'm actually his stepdaughter, but I've known him as a father for basically all of my life. He was a person with a great personality. He was a disciplinarian. He taught many lessons. And sometimes as children coming up, we think we cannot learn because we know so much. As we get older, we realize that the lessons that you're being taught is not to harm, but it's out of, it's out of love. He treated me as his own child because I've known him as such, and that's how he's known me ever since he met my mom. He had a very boisterous personality. He liked things his way. We may not have always agreed with him, but he liked things his way, and it was not a malice, it was out of love. It was out of caring. He will be greatly missed. Thank you. This is from your son, Rohan. November, November 10th, 2023. Father's Memorial by Rohan Crooks. Ecclesiastes 3, 1 to 2 says, For everything there is a reason, and a time for every matter under heaven. Time to be born and a time to die. My father's time was up on October 7th, 2023. The Bible also says in Psalm 90, verse 10, that you are given 70 years of life or 80 years if we are strong. His 97 years on earth surpass that which is mentioned in Psalm 90. As we memorialize my father today, let's try to remember that one of the reasons, my opinion, for funerals, or in this case memorials, is that even though we celebrate the life of the departed, we should also be reminded that life is itself a fragile, is fragile and death is final. Life is fragile because we do not know the exact moment we will leave this earth. So, we should live with love, care, and forgiveness. Visit or call each other while they are alive, and show them you love them as much and as often as you can. That is final. So take time to take care of each other, and remember, we only get one chance to die. So make it as caring and accommodating for the dying as best as you can. Make the transition as comfortable as possible. That is final on this earth. But the good book tells us that the departed is asleep and know nothing. No more pain or sorrow. There's so much I could speak of the memories I had with him when I was younger. He liked to tell jokes. 
One joke that comes to my mind, if my memory serves me well, was a story he told Dwayne and myself about an individual in Jamaica who was trying to sound proper by stating, some you heard. I, I don't remember this story, <laughs> but I remember after the joke was told, he said, some you heard. <laughs> Ever since, I will say, some you heard at times. My father is now gone. A road we all we must we all must travel at some point. As we reflect on his life, let's also remember the ones who are here with us now. We can hold our loved ones a little tighter, forgive as much as we can, and love as much as we can. May my father Roy Crooks soul rest in peace. but once, and no one has the power to tell when the ends will stop. Roar Crook's six clock has stopped ticking at age 97. He lived life passionately. He laughed loudly. He loved unconditionally. He loved his children, grandchildren, and his in-laws. Roy eagerly anticipated their calls and visits. Roy could be regarded as a gentle giant. At times he would become very spirited and later would be as humble as a child. He liked to help people, not to work, but for their advancement. Roy knew people in the right places and had many connections. Roy was a very sociable, happy, or lucky person who had many friends. He liked to have fun but was also an avid church goer. He accepted the Lord as his savior and believed and trusted in him. Roy did not go to bed without praying and reading his Bible. Over his long life, Roy changed in many ways as his family grew and he came to love the Lord. His grandchildren were his pride and joy. He loved children and was a child at heart himself. Roy's infectious smile, bigger than life personality, and wry sense of humor will be missed. Thank you. son Dwayne has prepared a video montage, so let's enjoy that.
pictures, don't you? Remember the good times. Remember the times of grace. We're going to sing Amazing Grace right now. 378. Amazing Grace of God. All six verses.
glad we have Matt Johnson here to play for us today. Enjoy your play, Matt, and thank you for coming and for being a part of our congregation today. When I first met Roy Crooks in 2005, I suppose, when I first came to this church, and here's an interesting thing as we sit here in this memorial service. Somebody could correct me, maybe, but I think he came to this church first for a funeral. <laughs> and liked it so much that he came back. And he became a member here. Am I right? Maybe nobody knows that story. Over the years, he got to know the people around him. You know where he sat. He liked his seat. And we appreciate his friendly ways. He always had a cheerful spirit. He was in church worship whenever he could be. And if he was here, he was coming at that door to greet me. I like that, by the way. I like to greet every person in the church on a Sunday. So he was one of those people. And of course, he loved visits and phone calls. And in the earlier years, he often talked about himself, but... He was very resilient. You have to be resilient to get to 97. And he kept on trying to be as healthy as he could and come out to church as often as he could. A few days before he passed on, Joy Simmons and I visited him in the hospital where Doreen was very much taking care of him along with other family and staff. He did not understand a lot of things as it is for all of us probably towards the end. He did not understand a lot of things that were going on, but he did understand the need to express his love. And he gazed longingly into Doreen's eyes, and he said, I love you. More than once he said, I love you. And then he turned to me, I love you. And he turned to Joyce, I love you. He was an appreciative man up into the end. And We've already been so Appreciate the days you have. Tell the people you love that you love them. That was Roy. So we're sorry for ourselves and for all the family and all the neighbors and all the community that we would no longer see him on this earth. He was interested in everyone's life and he loved his family. He was so proud of you. So we keep you all in prayer. But let's think a minute about where Christians go when they die. You know, little children can be concrete thinkers and give us older people some real clangers to think about. Let's put it that way. Shake us up. Sometimes we need to be shaken up. A little girl named Jenny was four years old and she asked her mother, does heaven have a floor? Good question, right? Her mother said, well, uh, Jenny, what do you think heaven is like? And Jenny looked up in the sky to the clouds and she replied, well, I can't see any floor, so I guess people are just up there on coat hangers. <laughs> see the concrete thinking? What holds them up there? It must be coat hangers. Imagine Roy and all our loved ones hanging around each other. Not necessarily on coat hangers. I think they're hanging around the throne of grace. Amen? One mother told her nine-year-old Heather that in heaven we have glorified bodies. Heather asked, do you think we'll look like Barbie? Yeah. A Christian ideal is not about the outside body, but about what's, but about what's inside the heart. One Sunday school classroom had several glass prisms hanging from the ceiling and as sunlight poured through the prisms it caused, caused rainbows to flash around the wall and observing this, Chris, age four whose mother had recently died said, you know what? My mom's up there helping God make those rainbows. He wanted that connection. So next time you see a rainbow, think of Roy. The color that he brought, the colorful world that he brought to this, to this world, to his life. Brett, age five, who frequently went fishing with his dad, told his mother, 
If Grandma's going to heaven with us, God had better have a pretty big fishing rod to haul her in with. <laughs> I don't know if that meant she was a little bit heavy or what, but um, Brett, God needed a really big cross to haul us all in with, to make us feel the resurrection and the life. And so that's what we celebrate today. We're going to talk about heaven. We're not going to try, like some of those children, to describe heaven. The truth is that we probably would not do much better than they did. People have all kinds of ideas about life beyond this earthly life. One slick old boy in Florida, Florida man, <clears throat> has turned death into an opportunity to make money. After learning he was dying of brain cancer, brain tumor, he took out a classified ad. He said in it for $20, he would deliver a message to loved ones on the other side. And here's what's interesting. He offered a money-back guarantee. <laughs> now, we're not told what clients could do if he didn't deliver or how they would know. Florida man knew how to make money from the vulnerable. We don't know much about what happens to us after we die. The Bible presents us with precious few details. Since we have so little hard information about heaven, it'd be fruitless for us to speculate except to say, that we know there will be no more death and no more tears. And that sounds pretty good to me. What we're going to celebrate is the good news. Life does not end at this point. At this point. We do not lose our loved ones forever to death. Those who die in Christ live with Him forever. And Christ shared some words in the, in the letter to the the first letter to the Thessalonians, chapters 4 and 5, I encourage you to go back and read them. And it gave them something of a definitive description of the nature of eternity. And he wanted to encourage them, and he said, uh, Paul said to them, Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep, or to grieve like the rest of those who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in Him. Bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in Him. And that's all that matters to Paul, and that is what he wants to communicate to his friends, and that is what he wants to communicate to us as well. Notice that Paul does not make light of losing a loved one. He does not tell his friends at Thessalonica not to grieve. Grief is one of the most natural and even essential experiences of life. Watch out for someone who does not grieve when a loved one dies, who always manages to maintain a stiff upper lip or refuses to shed a tear. Feelings are being stuffed down that need to come out. Someone has wisely said, tear this grief bleeds inwardly. Psychologist Catherine Saunders lost her 17-year-old son in a water skiing accident. She writes about the importance of expressing grief, and she says, unfortunately, Jackie Kennedy became the model for so many of us with her stalwart behavior after her husband's assassination. So often, she says, bereaved people I've talked to said that they truly tried to emulate Mrs. Kennedy and behave very bravely, never breaking down in public, never sharing. But sharing and breaking down are part of grief. And sometimes anger is a part of grief, too, as we question God. Vance Havner is a man of deep faith. Havner hoped his dying wife would be healed through some miracle, but she died. And he was plunged into grief. He simply did not understand why this had happened when it did. And so he shares these painful words. Whoever thinks he has the ways of God conveniently tabulated, analyzed, and correlated with convenient, glib answers to ease every question from aching hearts has not been far in this maze of mystery we call life and death. And then he adds that God has no stereotyped way of doing what he does. He delivered Peter from prison, but he left John the Baptist to die in a dungeon. I accept writes Vance Harvey, whatever he does, however he does it. And that's where all people of faith end up. We don't understand, but we accept whatever God does, however God does it. See, Everett Koop was a controversial man. He was the former United States Surgeon General. 
our chief medical officer in the nation. Coop first established his reputation as a highly regarded pediatrician surgeon who worked frequent, whose work frequently brought him into contact with dying children and grieving parents. And one day, he learned that his own son had died climbing the mountains of New Hampshire. And in a moving and inspiring portrayal of their grief, Everett Coop and his wife wrote about their sadness and the faith that sustained them. He said, our family never, our family life never will be the same. But we are trusting in the Lord to help us accept the empty place in our family circle and to keep us constantly aware that our son David is in heaven, which is far better for him. Like the hundreds of parents whom he had counseled, Coop and his wife found a permanent void in their lives after David's death. In an effort to be comforting, so many Christians glibly said, God will fill the void. Ever Coop wrote, instead we found that the void is really never filled, but God makes the void bearable. Paul does not minimize the hurt people feel when they lose a loved one. He does not tell us not to grieve. He simply tells us that we need not grieve in the same way as people who have no hope. Christ has conquered death. When we are absent from this body, we will be given a new spiritual body, a glorified body, not, I think, like Barbie or Ken, but a perfect body nonetheless. Grieve, not as those who have no hope. He could have easily said, fear not, as those who have no hope. I won't ask you to raise your hand if there's anyone in this room who's afraid of death. I don't want 